Is retired New York Giants quarterback Eli Manning a first ballot Hall of Famer? We get some insight from Bob Glauber, who's one of the Hall of Fame voting committee members on that, plus other related Giants decisions that are looming in the short term. That's coming your way next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode of the Locked on Giants podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Chena, credentialed member of the New York Giants media for Locked on, as well as for Giants Country, part of the Fan Nation Network. And a big welcome in to all my everydayers, my Blue Crew community members, my newcomers, and everybody in between. You are appreciated and loved by yours truly. Thank you for making us your first listener of the day. Or if you watch on YouTube, your first watch of the day. And speaking of credentialed members of the media, I'm so happy to welcome in my special guest today. He is Bob Glauber. He's retired now, but he's still very much, you know, he pops around. He's still part of the media family. We, we love him. And he's never going <laughs> to escape the media. Bob Lauber used to write for New York Newsday. He is a pro football Hall of Fame voter. And uh, I'm just thrilled to have him on the show with me. Bobby, hello. How are you? Hello, hello, Patricia. How are you? Gl- glad to be here. Always a pleasure. And uh, always, always love chatting. Definitely. I love chatting with you. And, you know, one of the reasons why I've asked Bob to come on the program is over on Giants Country, I did an article about Eli Manning, who is now eligible this year for Hall of Fame consideration. It's amazing, right? Five years have flown so quickly. Bob is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame voting committee. So I wanted to get some of his takes on Eli's candidacy. And Bob, you know, you look at Eli and what he's accomplished and, and, you know, you would think it's a no-brainer, but I have a feeling it's not going to be a no-brainer. I wanted to get your take on what you think uh, Eli's chances are of becoming a first ballot Hall of Famer and uh, where his obstacles lie? Well, I think it will be probably pretty challenging for him to be a first ballot Hall of Famer because there is there is a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, where Eli's career ranks, right? He was not Peyton. He was not Drew Brees. He didn't have those numbers that say, okay, lock, um, got to put him in uh, uh, right away. Uh, 500 career record. I think that goes against him. Lack of all pros and Pro Bowls. That will certainly go against him. But I think there are reasons for that. You know, when you play in, in at a time when your brother is playing and Drew Brees is playing, uh, this is a different conference for obviously for Peyton. So that doesn't explain the Pro Bowls. But you know, th- there are extenuating circumstances. But overall, numbers, longevity, championships excellence in championship situations a la two MVP Super Bowl MVPs uh two Super Bowl championships great runs in both of those playoff years uh so I I, I do think Eli Manning is a Hall of Fame player whether it happens on the first ballot um remains to be seen you mentioned you know the circumstances another circumstance he had to deal with obviously towards the end of his career, didn't play on very good teams. Mm-hmm. How much does the supporting cast, do you think, factor into his candidacy? I think it does factor in. Um, other quarterbacks have had that kind of challenge. You know, John Elway had that kind of challenge at certain points of his career. Late in his career, he got the running back to Earl Davis, and, and he was able to win championships, and, and he became a lock. Um, you know, Dan Marino had struggles sometimes to have people around him, and he never won a Super Bowl. So, but I think there is something to be said for, you know, the rosters in Eli's career, especially after that second Super Bowl, were were not top shelf. But you know what? As a quarterback, a lot is expected of you. And sometimes he was able to carry teams and sometimes it didn't work out. And I think that hurt Tom Coughlin as well. 
uh, because, you know, his record later in his career struggled and it was tough, um, partly as a result of problems on the roster, just not enough good players. Bob, if you could take us through what the Hall of Fame com voting committee considers. Is it strictly numbers? Is it accomplishments? Is it superlatives? What what has the most weight? I would say you, you mentioned those factors, all of the above. Um, and I don't know if any particular thing carries more weight than the other. You know, I think uh, team accomplishments matter a lot with quarterbacks. Individual accomplishments matter a lot. Um, you know, if, if Eli Manning had a couple of all pros, a couple of, you know, MVPs, um, more Pro Bowls, it's, it's a no-brainer, right? But he didn't. And that's going to be the debate, and that's going to be the crux of the discussion. Um, so, so do you automatically say, well, okay, he's got those numbers. He is one, he is one of the all-time greats. His numbers when he retired were, were top 10 in just about every category that there is and in terms of important passing category. So, you know, he's got, he's got the numbers. He's got the pelts on the wall, as Bill Parcells used to like to say. You know, those two Super Bowl runs culminating in Super Bowl MVP performances against the quarterback for the ages, that's going to matter. I feel like I'm kind of rehearsing my – my speech when I talk to my fellow voters. But I, I do know from talking to those voters that, you know, there is some skepticism about, you know, where he lies in the history of the game. But, you know, to me, Pat, Patricia, there's a saying that uh, a lot of times we like to use. Can you write the history of the NFL without Eli Manning or without other players that you consider? And the answer to that question is no, you cannot. Because because Eli Manning is part of NFL history. You know, he slayed the dragon twice. Um, and and that, that counts for something. If he doesn't get in on the first ballot, then he's going to start having some more competition. He's going to have Brady. He's going to have, I, I think, Drew Brees. Um, how much harder will it be, do you think, the longer this goes, you know, we saw Harry Carson, who uh, used to refer, I think he used to refer to himself as the Susan Lucci of the Pro Football Hall of Fame vote. And it took him, what, 13 years before he got in or something like that. So in Eli's case, you know, as these other quarterbacks come up for eligibility, how much harder is it going to be for him to, to get consideration? Well, I think it will be a factor. Um, you bring up a couple of quarterbacks. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger is going to be in there as well. And I think Ben Roethlisberger probably has numbers that would um, be a little more palatable for earlier induction into the Hall of Fame. Uh, but Eli Manning, uh, I think he would, it, it would be a little bit more of a struggle the, the more time goes on. Um, again, I think that he will get in at some point. It's just a matter of, you know, what point that is. The discussions at the Hall of Fame are very earnest. I will tell you that I, I really like the process. I don't know that there is a perfect process for any Hall of Fame, but I do know that, you know, you look at baseball, um, you know, you look at basketball, look at hockey. I, I, I do think there is an, there is an integrity and an honesty and a, and a, and a good vibe about uh, the pro football Hall of Fame. I think, I think things will be tweaked over time as far as the nominating process, but, when you get in a room with 50 fellow voters, all of whom know their stuff, it's, it's really fascinating and it's really compelling and honest. And um, I, I think the right people in the end uh, are, are put into the Hall of Fame. And I like to say that, you know, you walk into Canton and you go in that room with all the busts, show me a player in that room where you say, well, that, that guy really doesn't deserve to be there. Just just very few people fit that category, if any. I, and I have an awful lot of respect for every person and every player and every executive and coach who goes into that room. It takes a lot. Hey, Giant fans, football season is officially in the books, but that doesn't mean the excitement of betting on sports is over. Because right now you can get buckets when you place your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. 
New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any $5 winning bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. So go on and head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on today and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Bobby mentioned Tom Coughlin, who is also, you know, now eligible for the Hall of Fame. Is do you think Eli's candidacy is tied to Coughlin's or do you think they're separate? Because, you know, they obviously they went through their the, the prime of their careers together. Um, they experienced basically the same highs and the lows. So are they tied in to where, you know, the committee says, okay, Coughlin's definitely in. So does Eli automatically become, you know, definitely in or is it separate? That's an interesting question. And and I think there are a couple of ways to look at it. Yes, certainly they are. They are tied together. I mean, they are aligned like uh, Bill Walsh was with Joe Montana, um, uh, Terry Bradshaw and Chuck Knoll. You know, you have coaches that generally have been connected to, to one quarterback and Bill, Bill Belichick will be connected to Tom Brady when the time comes for both of those. Um, so, yes, there is some connection there. Um, and, and how you look at it, and, I, and I've kind of tossed this over in my mind about the presentation of both players, and, and especially Coughlin. And, and one argument might be, okay, do you, Tom Coughlin, you know, where, where, where do you want to look at that? Did he, you know, did he have a Hall of Fame quarterback? Uh, to win two Super Bowls, including two wins over the team of the ages. Well, if you say Eli Manning is not a Hall of Fame quarterback, my argument is, well, <laughs> okay, so Tom Coffin won two championships without a Hall of Fame quarterback. What What then? Or if you could say, hey, he, he did develop Eli Manning into a Hall of Fame quarterback, that is another feather in Tom Coughlin's cap. And you add in two in Coughlin's case, his work with Jacksonville, which was exemplary. You know, he took an expansion team and got him to two AFC championship games in very short order. So he has that going for him. And, and I think Tom Coughlin does get in at some point. I would hope it's sooner rather than later. But there are a number of candidates in that coach contributor class uh, that are that are worthy. Now, Buddy Parker, the former Lions coach, did not get in this year on that single candidacy for coaching – coaching uh and and executive and that's you know it's one more year that goes by that you don't have a coach or a contributor in the hall of fame so those those years are precious as everyone knows bob <clears throat> excuse me for for those of us who don't understand you know the the voting process is there a maximum as to how many guys at each position the committee will consider. So can, can they consider two quarterbacks in any given class or is it limited to just one? Great question. And the answer is absolutely. You can consider more than one player at the same position. Um, and that, you know, that will come into play with Eli Manning, Tom Brady, if Eli Manning and Tom Brady are up in the same year, it doesn't preclude the committee from selecting both of those quarterbacks in, in one given year. So the answer is a most definitively, uh, no, you can you can you can have five players at the same position. If if those five are the ones that are above the rest, uh, then they get in. You won't see that, but uh, that's that's the, the the point of it is that no, it's not just one player at one position. So it's just does that just apply then for the contributor part? Right for the contributor coach committee. All right, and then there is a senior committee as well. There have been three, I believe. It goes down to one. Pretty soon, if not if not now, uh, but in coach contributor, it's one slot each year. So there is a subcommittee that meets earlier in the year, and they hash out who they're going to put forth for the coach and or contributor. All right, coach or contributor. So once that person is put forward, then they are voted on in the general meeting, which occurs in January, along with the. Uh, modern players, as well as that senior selection. And if you could just take us through the whole presentation process is, is like in the case of Eli Manning, because you covered him, would you be the guy who would be making the case for him or how does that work exactly? Well, up to now, 
uh, that has been the um, procedure where the person representing, and you, know, you can really have anyone present the player. Um, I'm not sure that that might not be tweaked at some point down the road, but uh, regardless of that, I will speak up a lot on Eli Manning's behalf, as will Gary Myers, who covered him for many years, um, as will a number of people who felt that Eli Manning is a worthy candidate. And also, there will be people to speak who, if they do not believe that Eli Manning has the credentials and the numbers, they will speak up as well. So I expect, you know, some of these controversial, you know, not clear cut candidates, the discussion runs a long time, right? The Buddy Parker discussion ran for over an hour in a one day meeting. And that was intense. I've never quite seen a discussion like that one, especially over a person who has you know, not been around for such a long time. Uh, but there will be a vigorous, thorough discussion uh, about about Eli Manning. You know, compared to, say, um, you know, Brett Favre. I think Brett Favre's uh, presenter said, you know, Brett Lorenzo Favre and dropped the mic. You know, you just don't have to spend a lot of time on some candidates. Peyton Manning, same same kind of thing. Do you think at the end of the day, I mean, how special would it be if Eli and Tom Coughlin got into the, the Hall of Fame in the same class? I mean, you can't imagine how special that would be for both of those men. And I would think the emotions for both of them would be off the charts. Uh, again, it's it, it's who knows you know, whether that happens, but with Eli now being eligible and Coughlin having been eligible – um, that possibility does exist. So that would be that would be pretty special. All right, Bob, I want to pivot now to modern day Giants because they're about to begin, obviously, a critical offseason, year three of Joe Shane, Brian Dable. Giants didn't really have a good season last year. A lot of it was you could blame on injuries, but also some underperforming things. And I think we've got to start with some key decisions that this team needs to make. And you know, right off the bat, Saquon Barkley, what to do with him? You know, they they had him on the franchise tag last year. There's been some speculation that they won't franchise tag him again this year. They didn't trade him last year if they had the chance to. How do you see that playing out? What makes the most sense for that? I think what would make the most sense would be um, an affordable, longer-term contract that would be agreeable to both sides. He's He's a special player. He is their best offensive player. And, you know, you shouldn't be in the business of giving away your best talent. Now, I, I understand the franchise tag. I, I just don't know that it helps anybody if it's another year of on the franchise tag because he, he's stuck in limbo. And it's unfortunate. You know, he's, he's at a position, you know, with the franchise tag that, you know, the team has the leverage and he plays at a position that – the value of that is declining over time with running backs. We've all seen that. So I, I think it would be great for Saquon Barkley to, to reach a, a longer term agreement. And that could be, you know, three years is not a ton of time, but in, in terms of running back years, it, it is. So I think at least three years um, and then, then some, if you want to extend that contract, you know, for cap purposes, um, and the other school of thought would be, you know, you, you, you want to move on. You draft running backs and, you know, they're much more easy to find, um, not, not special running backs, but, you know, good enough running backs. And the bigger issue that with this team is going to be, you know, who the quarterback is. And is it Daniel Jones for another year? Probably. Um, you know, DeVito was a great story, but, you know, I don't know that you look at him as a longer term option. And then the other question is, what do you do in the draft? Not, you know, you're not high enough uh, right now for any of those top, you know, three quarterbacks, maybe top two or three. But, you know, you can do some things maneuverability wise to get up there if you feel like you've really got uh, conviction on one of them. So I think they're in a lot of limbo. And it's a critical offseason, especially for Joe Shane, in terms of what he does and the direction that he kind of charts for this team. Bob, you look at where the Giants currently are. You know, the season that they just had was probably the season we, we all thought they were going to have the first year. 
-hmm. So they're basically still rebuilding. You look at the, the last two Super Bowl teams, the 49ers and the Chiefs, and they built up their rosters quite differently. The 49ers from the inside out, whereas the Chiefs were more about building around Patrick Mahomes, who was a generational talent quarterback. For the Giants, what makes the most sense moving forward as far as building up this roster? That's a really good question, and I think that's the answer to that is going to take really like months to – figure out and, and get right. Um, and, and it's hard to say, you know, I've not been, listen, I think Daniel Jones works his butt off. I, you know, I, I commend him for getting the most out of his talent. He got that longer term contract. I'm just not convinced that the ceiling is high enough when you're talking about championships. I mean, that's the name of the game here is championships. So I think you've got to be open to looking elsewhere for a quarterback. I mean, you know, Brock Purdy came out, from nowhere and, and got a team to a Super Bowl. And, you know, you could argue that, you know, with Trey Lance, that was one of the worst selections and trades for a selection ever. Yet the team still managed to recover because Kyle Shanahan is a great Kyle Shanahan is a great developer of quarterbacks and they got by. And they they had great drafts even before he got there with a the defensive line. It's, you know, you go a four man rush and it's just such an advantage in the NFL. So I think you got to get the quarterback position right to begin with. And as far as Patrick Mahomes goes, man, there are, I believe, I believe he was 11 and there are 10 teams or whoever was ahead of the, the, the Chiefs that year are like, ah, we, we lost out. The Jets are in there. They got Jamal Adams that year. Um, you know, the Bears are in there. The It's just, one team after another that didn't take chance on on uh, Patrick Mahomes, you know, kind of lives to to regret that. Joe Shane's been playing it close to the vest as far as the quarterback position goes. He's basically said the expectation is for Daniel to start if he is healthy. But you know, you think about the quarterback spot, you know. Joe and, and Brian Dable, they're in a, a tough spot. You know, this is a, a big year. They've got to produce. Does it make more sense for them, do you think, to just get their guy and hitch their wagon to their guy, which in turn maybe buys them another year or two, as opposed to running it back with Daniel Jones, you know, regardless if he's healthy? Yeah, that's that, that, that's another good, really good question. Um, and, and I think the answer is, in this case, yes. Um, Brian Dable already did it uh, with Josh Allen in Buffalo. And, you know, he kind of, Built, helped build him from the ground up. We've already seen an example of him being able to do that. I think he got the most out of Daniel Jones at the perfect time for Jones, and he cashed in, right? But is that the best for this franchise? And I, I, I don't know. If you, if you, I, I think the Giants will take a very honest look at trying to get a quarterback, particularly in the draft, that they can say, you know what, this is this is Brian Dable's guy. We're going to go with this, and then and then he gets the benefit of, of some more time. I mean, it's it's pretty good that he gets to year three. We haven't seen that from a Giants coach since Tom Coughlin left. Um, so that's, that's a promising start. And John Mara, I know that he does not want to have this coaching turnover. He just doesn't. It's no, He knows it's not the formula for success in the NFL. So you, you've got to have stability at the head coaching position as well as general manager. And you've also got to get it right with the quarterback, and 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 you have to keep you have to keep taking shots. Um, I'm I'm just I'm just not sold that Daniel Jones is Jones is that guy uh, that Brian Dable can win a championship with. Hey, Giant fans! Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. If you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find what's ex what you're exactly looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So go ahead and keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. 
Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay's guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Now, for the Daniel Jones supporters out there who say it's the offensive line, which has been inconsistent, you know, for God knows how many years now, it's the lack of a number one receiver, which they haven't had since Odell Beckham Jr. It's this, it's that, it's the other thing. I mean, how when when you look at Daniel Jones's and whether he's the answer moving forward, how much of that is a factor versus how much of it is just Daniel Jones just not taking that step forward, not being a fast processor, not being, you know, being able to stay healthy and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's all interrelated. And I think you can make a case that, you know, he hasn't had the benefit of good offensive line play for, for most and much of his career. And when he did, you know, he kind of made the most of it. You know, Brian Dable really took advantage of the skill set of Daniel Jones, the running and the passing, as well as anyone had done, maybe except for the early part of that first year with Daniel Jones, and that was just lightning in a bottle that didn't last. So, um, yes, you can argue that because he didn't have a, a big-time receiver, because his offensive line play was inconsistent, because, you know, Barkley had been banged up uh, for a number of years. So, yes, it's all it's all tied in. I get it. But I'm talking about sometimes it's like so much has to go right for Daniel Jones to be at his best, and it's not always going to go right. right. Patrick Mahomes is the ultimate example of, you know, he had chaos around him at uh, on his team this year. He did not have Tyreek Hill. He had receivers who dropped passes and lined up offside in crucial spots, Kadarius Tony, you know, obviously. And yet Patrick Mahomes has the talent to overcome that. I, I just don't know that Daniel Jones has the upside um, to be able to deal with that on, on a more consistent basis. And that's that's a big deal for a quarterback. Bob, you mentioned Brian Dable before, and I want to pivot over to that for a moment, if I could. You know, he he changed up his staff. Some of it was firing. Some of it was guys left. But a big story, obviously, in the offseason has been his demeanor. And is he too intense for the job? Is his intensity turning people off? You know, you've covered Bill Parcells, who was probably as intense as they came. Tom Coughlin, I know we both covered him. He was pretty intense. Maybe not to the same degree as Dable, but do you think that the intensity of Dable is just overblown, or is there something there that bears watching? Well, I think I think he bears watching. I don't know that I, – I haven't heard of too many NFL coaches who, uh, you know, were looked at as like, ah, this guy's too intense. You know, uh, Lombardi, too intense. Ditka, too intense, you know? I mean, intensity in football is usually uh, an advantage and, and a kind of a good thing. But sometimes, you know, you go too far, and you've got to be able to manage people. And Brian Dable, until, you know, two years ago, was not in a position to fully manage people. And, you ha and there's a lot to it, right? Everyone has their own life, and, and you know, everyone values – who they are and what they are. And when you have your boss who is, you know, not giving you what you think you need, and I'm talking about Wink Martindale, then you're going to have problems. You know, Wink Martindale is a very strong-willed person as well as Brian Dable. So I think it was a learning experience for Dable. And I think that if you're a good coach in this league, you learn to adapt. And you learn when it's a little bit too much and when you know, certain people need positive reinforcement. Other people can live with being criticized and kind of flourish that way. But it's not the same for everybody. And you mentioned Bill Parcells. One thing Parcells did over his career was he adjusted. He realized that Joe Morris was a bit more sensitive than Lawrence Taylor. And, and he had to kind of change his demeanor as a result. So hopefully Dable, particularly with his coaches, um, can kind of get that balance to where he needs it to be because it's really important. Yeah, definitely. You know, speaking of the coaches, I want to get your take on the promotions in particular the, that Dable, you know, decided to make. Mike Kafka, assistant head coach, 
you know, Shay Tierney, uh, passing game coordinator. It seems like to me, and this is just a theory I have, that they shifted, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the responsibilities around possibly freeing Dable up for the for an incoming young quarterback so that he could be a little bit more hands-on. You know, we talked about earlier how, you know, if you're Dable and Shane, you probably want to go down with the ship with your guy. Mm -hmm. Is, do you think there's something to that, or or do you think that that those promotions were basically, you know, thanks for sticking by me, you know, you guys did a great job, and here's your reward? Yeah, I, I think it's more, and I, and I can kind of see where that, where where you can go with that. Um, I guess it's certainly possible, but I, I I think it's more a function of he realizes that there are some people look in the league looking at. Brian Dable and the Giants says, "Hey, is this a is this a reputable place to go? You know, you you want to have a place where people want to be." And I think it was more a function of, "Okay, these guys have stuck with me." You know, Kafka he he did develop under under Dable, um, and it was a valuable resource. So I think it was more, "Okay, we're going to give you some promotions. We're going to give you some extra money. We're going to make it." so that this is a, a better place to work. Now, because I think Dable, if he gets a quarterback uh, and he he needs the time, he'll take the time, okay? He'll he'll assign those tasks that he needs to, to free up time himself. He'll, he'll, he'll manage to do that. So I don't, I don't know that there is a, you know, like tried and true reason that, that he did that for the purpose of, getting more time with a quarterback if they, if they do draft one. All right. Now, final question. If the giants go out, they get all the guys that they feel they need. And if this team, for whatever the reason bombs again, how much trouble do you think realistically speaking, Joe Shane and Brian Dable will be in at the end of the year? I'm thinking of like, I'm imagining myself to be John Mara with me asking that question of him <laughs> and, and he'll go, Oh, what do you ask? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, but I, I think there would be some, some trouble for, for one or both. Uh, generally speaking, a general manager does get a second crack at a coach. So I think the more trouble, the, the guy with the, in more trouble would be Brian Dable. If this thing goes South, and you, and you can see, you know, you know, John Merrick can stand up in training camp at that press conference and, you know, be loose and everyone's zero and zero. And it's like they ask him about the future. Ah, let's, you know, we'll get to that when we get to it. But, man, the season goes on. Even if you know you're in a rebuilding situation, look at Joe Judge's second year when that just got away from him. It just snowballs. Right. There's so much attention uh, placed on on this sport and this team in this environment that it's really tough. So this has got to be at least uh, nipping at the heels of a playoff spot, unless you've got a, a you know, a, a young quarterback who you realize, you know, is not in a position um, to be able to do that just yet, but there has got to be meaningful progress at a lot of levels this year for, for that partnership to continue. And then I'm sorry, one more follow up. If, okay. I, if I may, um, Obviously, you can't go on with a rebuild indefinitely, even though, you know, you're constantly tweaking the, the roster. So at what point do you say, OK, you know what, this year we had injuries or this year we had a rookie quarterback in there. At what point do you say, OK, it's been two years, it's been three years, it's been four years. We're not making the progress we want to make. It's time for a different direction. Oh, well, I, th I think you let things play out a good amount, at least, you know, say three quarters of the season before you start making that kind of evaluation. But, you know, I, we talk about John Mara, but man, I, I've known him my whole, my whole journalistic career cover football. So I've seen him. There is no more intense owner and owner who wants to win than John Mara. And he is not, he's patient but only if he sees that there is going to be um, a payoff at the end. But if he sees that you're spinning your wheels, then he'll 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 blow it up again. He doesn't want to have to do that, but I think he would. And then Bob, just put to rest this theory that a lot of Giant fans have that John Mara is a meddlesome owner. 
a meddlesome owner? Well, I, I mean, I will say John Mara, he's not meddlesome in the, in the strictest sense and the, the, you know, typical, he's not George Steinbrenner. Um, but John Mara does get involved in every part of the organization. But, you know, written into these contracts, especially with the general manager, is, you know, they are responsible. They have the final call over a lot of these decisions. So and that does go back to George Young, who I I knew and covered for many, many years. And once once John Mara's father put that set up in motion about the general manager having that power, because the general manager did not have that power when Wellington's teams were struggling. But once that arrangement was made and it was the George Young Bill Parcells championship run, that stuck. Um, but I think John, if he feels that things are not going his way, um, I, you know, I think he'll speak up about it. So I, you know, I, I don't know that it's a bad thing. He's, he owns the team, <laughs> you know, he can, he can, he can do what he wants. Um, but if he's, in, if he's, Getting involved in those things and those decisions, as a result, do not pan out. Well, you know it's 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 fair game, uh, but I think overall he gives his people the flexibility and the um, the bandwidth to to do their jobs and do it as they see fit. And if he really feels like something is amiss, then he's he's going to speak his mind, which he has the right to do, as you sure. said, because he is the owner. But, you know, he's not going to be, you know, micromanaging, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, I no, I don't I don't think he is. a. I don't think he is a micromanager. Um, but John knows John knows that his legacy is is tied to what happens here. You know, he doesn't he doesn't have that. Those championships were a long time ago. Mm. And John knows that if he gets up a spot in, you know, under consideration in the Hall of Fame, he's got to have the team. That that wins championships again, and and that takes some doing. Yeah, going to be interesting to see how this season plays out. The decisions, you know, supposedly they have their plan in place, but we all know that sometimes plans don't go quite according to how we script them out. But uh, Bob, always great catching up with you. You know, you've always been so good to me, and I appreciate it. Giant fans, check him out. He's a published author. He is a wealth of knowledge. He's also one of the, and I don't mean to make you feel old because we all know, Bob, you're not, you're, you're not over 40 just yet, but uh, he's actually one of the, the longtime writers who I always looked up to as a young journalist. And now that I'm an old journalist, I still look up to him. So <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's great. When, when someone says I grew up reading you, uh, it's, it's okay. It's still good because you know what? I kept, I kept working and I, I have loved having you in the press room and uh, lo you love talking football. It's always good. I always get smarter talking football with you. So um, keep at it and, uh, and keep enjoying it. And I appreciate you so much. I really do. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for us on today's Locked on Giants podcast. Be sure to keep it here all week long. We'll have more episodes for you. For the amazing Bob Glover, I'm Patricia Trena. We will see you tomorrow, Giant fans.